Welcome to episode 90 of The Leap Home, Blood Moon. In this week's episode, Sam has to save a vampire's bride from being ritually sacrificed at the hands of a crazed cultist. With Al employing a range of anti-vampire measures, Sam needs to find a way to make his friends see sense before it's too late to prevent the Blood Moon being honoured with a murder. When a crucial error puts Sam and his wife in mortal peril, will anyone come to their aid? Or is this one destined to be a draining experience? Garlic. I know it's garlic. Why is it around your neck? Hmm? Hmm? No reason. No reason. Good evening, Ian. How are things with you? Not too bad, Jerry. I'm enjoying your, your new neckwear there. Well, yep. We need to fend off certain creatures. I'm not sure asparagus is the way to go, but... No, I thought that perhaps uh, you may be as uh, horny as the characters... In this week's episode, Nobody is as horny as the characters in this week's there episode. There are some points out there where knees are trembling, thighs are being rubbed, yes, gussets are drenched. <laughs> Should say we've reached episode 90. As oh, you said, that's a landmark occasion, possibly the last landmark occasion given the number of remaining episodes. Mm. We have a gothic spectacular. It's a shame that Halloween was two weeks ago or one week ago if you're listening on YouTube. It is very gothic. It's the, the characters are the type of people you want to tell to grow the F up. And stop oh. acting like 14-year-old goths. Sam tries. Yeah. Oh, we're hanging. Oh, we'll do that. What are you talking about? Oh, I'm writing to Alistair Crowley. Are you? Very good. Ah. <sighs> yeah. Talking for people who need to grow up, we're available on social media at Leap Home Podcast on X, Facebook, and all those other similar sites. You can find show notes at theleaphome.com. And if you want to hear each episode one week early, head to the Colombo Podcast Productions YouTube channel where you will find it and you can like, subscribe, and request notifications by clicking the bell. Are you ready? Let's crack on. So a bit of a, a difference this week, we didn't get a post-leap sequence in the previous episode, as you recall. Yeah, we've got the chap in the waiting room, I think. Yeah, so he doesn't actually appear in this episode, but he is clearly the man in the portrait at first i thought this is one of those episodes where they show you the wrong trailer for the upcoming episode for whatever reason but no he is it is him he just yeah. doesn't appear this time yeah. he was in the end of last week and that was it so we find sam panicking as he leaps into a coffin which fortunately isn't sealed but when he bursts out he is disturbed to find himself in a candlelit gothic castle room dressed like a vampire with lightning strikes all around and a woman dressed in white who may be a ghost. Addresses him as Darling and asks if he slept well. Oh boy. After the credits, we return and we see it is when? It's the 10th of March, 1975, and I think Sam in voiceover notes that he is used to the unusual, but on this occasion he may well have landed in the middle of Bizarre. As lightning strikes, the woman looks out and declares in a supposed English accent that it is a blood moon just as he claimed it would be, and that she is helpless when she looks at him. And is it, what's his name? That's Nigel? Yeah, that breaks the immersion, doesn't it? <laughs> Nigel. That's the least sexy name in the history of human endeavour. Anyway, she says he will, she will repay his love a thousand times over when the moon is at its highest point tonight. Sam obviously does not like the sound of that. No, we He doesn't a, know right now that she is extraordinarily uh, vulnerable. No, he will figure it out very soon though. We hear a, a werewolf howl outside as Sam tries to gather his wits and insists that he hasn't been offended by what she said to him. But as he stutters that it is fine, he turns to be met with a weird looking butler who wants to know if he wishes to inspect the livestock. Is this Aberdeen we're in? Uh, who knows? Maybe a Welsh castle. Yeah, okay. But yeah, this is Boris, a badly acted butler who monotones. Okay, so this is the, I mean, you may have trivia for this. He's referred to as Boris, but I think in the credits or in IMDb, it's Horst. Uh, you know, Boris is what I've got. Okay, one or the other. Let's go with Boris. Okay. He, he has the um, Terribly performed, we have to say at this point that it might be the worst acting in the whole of Quantum Leap. Uh, even though he's meant to be this sort of monitor, he does it badly. <laughs> okay. It's really unfortunate. Hey, sorry what, if you're listening, <laughs> but it was a bad job and you must know it. The woman tells a, a confused Sam that she had Boris bring up some sheep from the village for the ceremony. And he tries to act quite casual before being frightened by a growling, I think it's a, is it a Doberman? Doberman's what yes. I've written. Named... I don't have its name. Vlad. Vlad, okay, I wonder where they got that name mm. from. Not very original, is it? 
However, she calms the the mutt easily and then takes it as she leaves to prepare for the arrival of the others. We should know that these sheep don't get another mention and aren't referred to in any of the parts of the ritual that we see. No. I wonder if she was being fooled. Potentially. He asked Boris if this is all a joke and wants him to confirm that it's just a little bit of fun, this party that they're going to be having. Yeah, Boris refuses to speak to him. He buffs the coffin lid, covers it with a drape and asks whether, in quote, the master will be wanting anything else, which Sam immediately responds to with no, prompting Boris to walk out the door, <laughs> yes. no, think, no matter what else Sam has to say. I think it, it, it takes us attitude a, a few times in the episode. Sam is then spooked by Al appearing in a, a puff of smoke through a goat skull on the wall, which ends up giving the hologram a scare before they establish it's not Halloween and get down to business. Oh, uh, Sam. Sam, have you, uh, have you looked in a mirror yet? Oh, no, I have. No, I haven't seen any around. Why? Oh, I haven't seen any mirrors around. Well, that's not surprising. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? I think you've leaped into a... A what? A vampire. A vampire? I know it sounds strange, <laughs> but you should see the guy in the waiting room. He looks like a cross between Bella Lugosi and a sick corpse. He's got all the markings of the undead. And you have all the markings of the brain dead. Now, what does Ziggy have? It's March 10th, 1975. Yeah. And you're just outside London. Oh, Sam, you leaped out of the country. I, I figured that out already. Now, what, what else? Yeah. Uh, your name is Nigel Corrington. You're uh, London's most eccentric and expensive artist. Mm -hmm. uh, your family has lived in this castle for five generations. And you just shocked the art world by marrying a homeless girl named Alexandra Hill. A homeless girl? Yeah. Uh, Why am I here, Al? Uh, well, um, I don't know. We haven't run the program that far yet. Why not? Um, because of the vampire? You are uh, not running the program because there's a vampire well, in the waiting room. Is wait, that it? Is that what you're telling me? You should see this guy Corrington, Sam. He's, he's a first-class flesh eater. He's got all the classic signs. He's got the pale complexion, the beady eyes, the lustful stare. Yeah. You just described yourself. A couple of things. Okay. Al describes this guy's looking as a cross between Bella Lugosi and a sick corpse. Surely a corpse is past being sick. You'd have thought so. By definition. Hmm. I mean, they, saying that, that, I've seen some corpses after they've been done up for viewing that look better than some alive so people. So Sam. Yeah. <laughs> this thing with Alexandra Hill, so is this an Eliza Doolittle thing or is it a human sacrifice in the offing? Who knows, we'll find out. But what we do know now is that the person Sam's leapt into this, Nigel, has got similar um, tastes in the woman he goes after. Extremely vulnerable. A homeless woman. Yes. With no support network, no yeah. family, no one who's going to miss her. Right up Sam's alley. Al isn't amused by Sam's little quip there at the end. No, and Sam is not happy with Al being spooked and demands that he repeat that there are no such things as vampires and that he won't bring up again. Although Al does do this, he immediately feels that he's been vindicated when Sam confesses that he leapt into a coffin. Yes, which only reaffirms Al's belief that he's a blood-sucking ghoul, causing Sam to dismiss him until he knows why he is there. Al, at this point, notes that he hopes Tina has picked up his turtleneck from the cleaners to protect his <laughs> carotid artery. And we move forward a little bit to Alexandra and Sam examining this portrait. I'm going to call her Alex from I've now on. I've written Alex through it in my notes, so we can stick to that. Yes, okay. Sam is standing with her as she looks up in awe at this painting of a Dracula-looking dude from 300 years earlier. So, Sam has told her, or at least Nigel has told her, she hopes that Sam doesn't mind her wearing this dress she found in a trunk upstairs that she yeah, assumes belonged to his great-grandmother. I, I don't know why, but also that's a bit creepy. Yeah, don't be going up to the attic and putting on old well, clothes. I suppose it depends what's been said previously. If you said, You've got the run of the house, whatever you want, sure. or don't touch anything, don't open the trunk. Yeah. yeah but she seems comfortable with it. Yep. I assume the rest of the time she wears jeans. Yeah, I suppose at this point, what, the 70s, 
people were running about in bell bottoms and, yeah. and what have you. Floral yeah. dresses, dresses, maybe, yeah. Yeah, Mark Bowen would be all the rage. <laughs> Sam, for some reason, feels the need to start interrogating her about himself and yes. his situation as if it, it wouldn't sound really weird. Yeah, he wants to know about the coffin, but as he starts to ask, they are interrupted by a bell signifying the arrival of their guests. Alexander wants to make a good impression as the lady of the castle and Sam smiles and nods as Boris brings these guests in. Yeah, it's a, a Victor Drake and his companion Claudia who both remark how honoured they are to join him on this sacred of nights. I like to think that Victor Drake is a Duckula reference. Do you remember Count Duckula? Yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. yeah. And he's the ah, vampire. Drake, right, yeah, okay, sure. He introduces his companion Claudia who refers to Sam as my lord. Is a little bit extreme? Yes. I suppose we don't know the position of Sam, you know, in, in, in society. Maybe he is... Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, he's a painter. He kind of... Yeah. Well, of course, you can be a painter. Your title... I suppose your, within this sort of cultish setup, he might have... No, just a, within the uh, aristocracy. I suppose, uh, there's that as well, given that he's English. Yes. It's also noticeable at this point that Sam doesn't immediately introduce Alex to them. He doesn't, but Drake, for the first but not last time, openly flirts with her. Um, and we find out that he asked to be there for this blood moon. And he, yeah, he really is a, a, a fantastically smarmy individual. Yeah, I'm sure the actor is having a, a ball playing this role. Yes. He refers to Sam as being, or Sam's name as being legendary among the followers and that Alex is a vision of beauty. Yeah, and for some reason, this makes Sam himself extremely jealous, you can tell. Yes. He shouldn't, I mean, obviously if he's playing the character, but we oh. know that he can't play the character. Yeah. It's interesting that this way there's no crossover of um, Sam with the leapies, yes. Mike, it's, it's not convenient for the story. Yeah. And Sam's obvious displeasure doesn't stop Drake from kissing Alex's hand which clearly has the desired effect on her, especially when he admits that he is a ravenous. She spends most of the rest of the episode in a sort of yes. semi... Mm -hmm. um, I'm not even sure what the, the right word would be, but um, stimulated. Uh, yeah, aroused, certainly. But also kind of... On the brink. But yeah, but at the same time, almost anxious about it as well. Like She seems well, almost kind of yeah. sh diminished, but also... Um, I think, she's, well, I think she's intimidated as well. I think so. I think she's not used to this environment for a start. Yes. Later on, as they sit in the dining room, Alex informs them that Sam's great-great-grandfather built the castle and offers to show Drake his portrait later. She's, although I said she's not comfortable, she's starting to act like the tour guide. She's only just arrived in the scene and now she's telling people who I'd imagine would know quite a lot about the, the history of Sam and his family. Yes, but I suppose she's moving on to topics that she's confident about, that she maybe has a bit of knowledge or she's picked up. Sure. At this point, Al reappears and gestures to Sam to come out to talk. And so, excusing himself to check in dinner... That must be out of character. Very weird. As if you would do that when you've got staff. Yeah, well, yeah, the kind of guy who keeps a servant in his house yeah. is not going to say, I'm just going to check on dinner. <laughs> and Alex notes it and makes a comment. Of course, yeah. In any case, he stumbles out to find Al wearing garlic around his neck. Yes, and he pulls what I assume must be a soundproof curtain because he immediately starts <laughs> talking at full volume right behind it. <laughs> However, more importantly, Al tells him that he is likely there to solve the murder of Alex, whose body is found in the forest in a few days, drained of blood. That's interesting. Yes. Solve the murder, not prevent the murder. He says solve it. Okay. Maybe solve it in advance. That's... Not solving a murder. No, no, it's, yes, yes. I think preventing the murder is probably what Sam is going to try and do. Yeah, okay. We get a brief exterior shot with torrential rain before returning to the conversation where Al now turns the tables on Sam and asks him to admit that he has leapt into a vampire. Yeah, well, the fact that she was found drained of blood seals the deal for, for him and his, um, his There's belief. There's no other way for blood to exit <laughs> a human body. But Sam wants a, a more logical explanation and all of a sudden decides that he is a scientist who only deals with facts. But we know that he's believed more nonsensical stuff than this before. He got chased by a monster in Egypt. Yeah, and believes in what's the one where he fell in love with the psychic person. Yes. And even his stuff with, in the trilogy and all that type of... Yeah, he believes all sorts of gobbledygook. 
And he believes in a higher power that's directing his leaps. Exactly. But he has trouble himself explaining why he woke in a coffin and doesn't convince Al that it could all simply be a, a marketing tactic to drive up the price of his paintings, which I think is a, a very reasonable... Very reasonable. Yeah. Ziggy apparently is having trouble connecting to the British computer systems. Mm, okay. Uh, which means there's not a lot of information available. However, Sam asks Al specifically to check into the Blood Moon and into Victor Drake. Yes, but he doesn't think that Alex is part of the, the cult. I'm not sure why he thinks that so far, or why he doesn't think well, that. He's immediately identified her as being in love with Nigel. <laughs> and thinks that, yeah, she simply appreciates going from the, the streets to a, to a castle. So basically she can be exploited. If you don't do what you're told or don't do what we want you to do... Back you're, where you came from. Yeah. He also does his usual of... Just creating facts by stating that he thinks she really loves him. Yeah. Only, I mean, it's only been a matter of hours. Yeah, no, yeah, he's decided this. Because, again, it's the whole assuming the best on everything from everyone. No one's going to lie to him. No one's going to trick him. Everyone is exactly what they present themselves as. I mean, without wanting to be too cynical, there's a woman who's homeless living on the streets. It may well be that she would be open to lying about her love for a, a rich man who owns a castle to get off the streets. It's a very yeah. it's a very good reason but to... But Sam's assessed the situation and yeah. determined that that's not Must the just case. be loved. Not that she's uh, yes, cold and hungry. Of course not. Back in the dining room. Yes, Al's left and Drake offers a, a dark and a gothic toast to the Blood Moon. I called it a creepy toast yeah. to the Blood Moon. And I think the way Sam reacts to this must... Surely ring alarm bells for everybody else at the table. Yeah, he's too nervous to use the word blood and just raises his glass to the moon and then nervously drops it. I believe my husband is more excited than he dare admit. He hasn't been himself all evening. Is that right? Nothing serious, I hope. No, no, just kind of one of those days. <laughs> I trust everything's been prepared for the ceremony. Ceremony? must be very satisfying to experience such a sacred event with such a hauntingly beautiful creature. You flatter me, Mr. Drake. I worship you, Lady Corrington. To be honest, I'm not quite sure what to expect. I know that the ritual involves some kind of sacrifice. An offering to the beast. It's quite simple, really. Within each of us, there lives a beast. A power. Some choose to fear it. Others to deny it. There are others who seek to embrace it, to feed off it. As with everything, there is a price to be paid. A sacrifice to be made. So now emotional and extraordinarily horny, Alex reminds them that they have a few hours until the moon is high and suggests that they move to the study for a drink. Sam immediately rejects this idea and insists that he and Alex should clean the table despite the fact that Boris is still working. He is a dopey idiot. He's never cleaned the table in his life. At this point, I'm thinking, even if Sam thinks this is all nonsense, why is he ruining it for them? Yeah. yeah he's got, other than the fact he's been told she gets murdered. But, that's but he's thing, got no yeah. reason to think that's directly connected to this event. It's no. two days later, as far as he's aware. Yeah. Alex is breathless. And after gaining her composure to a degree, she manages to stand with shaky legs and leaves with him. I've noted here that she's clearly both distressed and aroused by the events of the evening. <laughs> So as they walk through to the kitchen, Alex wants to know what has come over him. And Jealous Sam tells her that she needed fresh air. In the kitchen? 
It's not all she needed, I don't think. She's worried that he's decided she's not worthy of the ceremony after all, and that's why he's having second thoughts. She places her hand on his chest while explaining that she was abandoned <laughs> in a box by her parents as a newborn and grew up with 20 other lost souls. She lived on the streets and was convinced that she would die alone until she met him and pleads with him not to make this come true. I, in the original history, I wonder how Sam or Nigel got into this relationship because someone living on the streets... Although in Hollywood you can see past it all, but someone who's lived on the streets would be extremely unkempt, they would be dirty, they'd be filthy. I'm sorry, I, 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 can't, I can't imagine there's too many people going, oh yeah, I quite fancy her. No, but maybe he had her come over for a, to paint her or something, or I thought it was an interesting a homeless study. Study. I don't know. And then when he got her cleaned up, she's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you scrub up well. And she's like, oh, I, I love you. Yeah, no. Yeah. I don't know, it's just... I suspect it's maybe not true love on Nigel's part. Yeah, maybe he, this is entire ploy is to get her in for this ritual. Yeah, we know yeah. it's only happened in the last couple of months. Sure. I worried Sam responds by suggesting that they cancel this ceremony, which the tearful Alex can't understand. And of course, it's ent entirely out of... Yeah, he doesn't behave in any way. If, he's not fooling anyone who might think he wasn't <laughs> Nigel at yeah. this point. Just at this point, a creepy Victor comes through and interrupts them, telling... Sam that he hopes he will not be monopolising his lovely wife for the entire evening. And asks if he can present a gift. So in the study, Sam opens a box to find what? It's a dagger. Which, an, an ornate dagger, yeah. Yes, which Victor says he bought from a peddler and claims it once belonged to Count Bathory himself. Claudia is a really horny at this point and proceeds to kiss all over Drake's neck while stating that he is an extremely generous man. Alex says it must be worth a fortune and Victor agrees, but Sam says it's a lovely gift he must refuse. Yeah, he initially declines this, but Drake insists and remarks that he will find it useful in the future. Huh, okay. That's a weird thing to say, you'll find this dagger useful. Yeah, this clearly um, troubles Alex, who looks very flustered and smashes a glass. Yeah, she's watching Claudia kiss and slither all over Drake. While Drake stares directly at Alex herself, which causes her to go weak at the knees and excuses herself to, um, to, to freshen up. I think at this point Alex is realising she's in over her head. As much as she's enjoying some of the attention, yeah. I think she realises that she doesn't really understand what's going on here and it might not be all good news. Now at this point, Drake delivers the most insightful line in the entire series. Which is? <clears throat> Quote... I can see why you have chosen her. She's really quite vulnerable. Yes, 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 yes. Tick, check. He knows. Sam's like, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the, the writers know. This, is a, this must be an inside joke. Perhaps. Victor also notes that as there are many hours until the ceremony, he would like to find a private space to prepare with Claudia. To bang Claudia. Perhaps. Or yeah. maybe just to sit and chat and read a book. And so Sam says he'll get Boris to show him up. But incredibly, <laughs> this is weird behaviour. Yes, uh, yes. Why would Boris do this? Victor sent Boris home. Yes. That's... Why would Boris take instruction from Victor? Well, you no, know, you might take, because if he is one of the your, your, your master's guests and he says something, you'll, you'll obey him. But it's, that's not the weirdest thing. The weirdest thing is Drake... Asking uh, Boris to... Well, uh, dismissing your host staff. Perhaps he doesn't want witnesses around. No, I'm sure, but... It's just a weird thing to casually say, oh yeah, I told uh, Boris to go home and expect that Sam would go, yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, I don't know. It's very unusual. In scenario. any case, yes. Claudia asks him to join them. At this point, Sam will have absolutely uh, put his pants. At the, yes, this the is not the type of woman that he is attracted to. No. Got for a threesome. Oh, uh, no, I, 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 I can't. I've got uh, some um, trips over something as he fall, yeah. walks out. Yeah. She wants to bathe in his power, and Victor assures Sam that she is quite energetic. <laughs> At which point, <laughs> Sam, as you say, literally defecates himself. <laughs> uh, it's visible. You can see him do it. 
yes, the space he, moves. He leaves as quickly as he can, allowing Al to reappear with his big book of a vampire spotting by Dr. Laszlo Fang. <laughs> See all this? Honestly, I mean, I'm sorry. I apologise if people are into this, the occult and all that, but it's, it's fine to be into it, like, just think it's an interesting subject matter. Fictional, yeah. But there are people, that, like, say, normally it's we kiddie goth types who grow out of it but there's people who are into this sort of stuff and act like this and you think what are you talking about yeah anyway he reads from it uh, and finds that vampires are often sex obsessed and thinks that this proves his fear is just although sam does the obvious and notes the similarity with holograms yes al says he's not going to laugh when he hears about the blood moon oh, what is it it occurs once every 10 years, which is a uh, lunar eclipse. It's when the Earth's between the sun and the moon. Okay. And the moon's bathed in the Earth's shadow. It's a sacred event for the walking dead or the undead. Yeah, they the, rise. The owner, Count Bathory. Yes. One of the first recorded vampires. Apparently, he killed 650 virgins in rituals so that their blood could give him eternal life. I mean, that's, that's I suppose, fair enough, isn't it? Yeah, I thought it was just for skincare. The townsfolk who caught him uh, walled him up in his own bedroom where he lived for a further three years, surviving by drinking his own blood. And piss. Which caused the moon to turn red, like blood. <laughs> and since then, a sacrifice to him has been performed on that day. Why would you, if you killed, why would you perform a, a sacrifice to him? To honour him. Why would be, the townspeople killed him? So yeah, who's honouring him? The vampires. Oh, right. Okay. Al tells him that Scotland Yard recorded Alex's death as loss of blood due to a puncture in the neck. And the murder weapon was... Teeth. No. Silver dagger. Yeah. Just like the one that Victor gifted to Sam yeah. moments so, earlier. <laughs> so at this point, Sam's attitude changes from sneering to concerned. And he shows Al his gift. Yes. And he notes that it can't be Nigel who committed the crime because then as soon as he leaped in, History would have been changed and he would have leaped back out again. So they both assumed that it was Drake. I thought maybe it was the butler. Well, the butler usually does it. Yeah. Unfortunately, due to the Blitz, Ziggy has nothing on Drake and the Sam. Blitz 30 years earlier. Yeah, but it destroyed a lot of records. Bombing, didn't it? You know, records were destroyed. Okay. Yeah. And so Sam gets frustrated with the, the leap and not even knowing what he looks like. Al says he looks like the guy in the portrait. Who is this, yes, who is a spitting image of the guy in, in the waiting room. Well, that's, that's not unusual. I mean, they yeah. were their family. Well, what Al's trying to say is he is the guy in the waiting room and he's been alive for 300 years and not the great, great grandson. No, it might just be your relatives who, these inbred types as well, all look like each other. Sam wants to know how he can convince Al that he is not a 300 plus year old <laughs> vampire. So, much like in the portrait for Troy in the episode, they head to the handy tomb in the garden. Yes, fortunately he has not been buried, <laughs> but is uh, above ground in this tomb and Sam slides open the lid to reveal a coffin. Now, I thought that Al couldn't handle dead bodies. Well, I think if it's going to reassure him that the guy's actually dead, he'll be happy with it. Right. Before they can open the coffin, however, they are disrupted by screams from the castle. Yes, from Alex inside. So Sam rushes to the kitchen to find her in a state and this is quite... I wasn't expecting this. You don't normally see this in this Quite type of... graphic. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the, the dog, Vlad, is lying on the ground with his throat cut on the floor, which, yes, is, is very unusual for a, a TV show. Absolutely. Al is still blaming hobgoblins and fairies for this, but Sam is not interested in his mumbo-jumbo. They wonder who could or what could have done this. And at this point, the sinister Drake enters and touches the blood as he asks how it happened. Sam says he was about to ask the same question, and Victor claims not to have been involved whilst subtly hiding a bloodstain on his waistcoat, which we assume Sam did not see because he doesn't react as if he saw it. Sure. He then weirdly offers to go make sure that Alex is okay. This is uh, Drake, but Sam tells him that he will take care of his own wife and Drake says he will meet them in the study. Why would... That's, I've dismissed your, your, your staff and now after this horrific event, do you want me to go and comfort your well, wife? I think what's obviously happening here is... Drake expected Nigel to behave in a certain way and having arrived and seen him acting like this complete wet blanket is he's sensing a change in the power dynamic he's taking control of the event and the ritual and everything else because he thinks that he is now like the alpha in this Sam situation. is about to be cucked well we'll see so Sam joins Alex in the bedroom as she stands at the window staring at the moon and is obviously extremely fragile 
She doesn't understand who could possibly have killed their dog out of the five people in the building. <laughs> Sam tells her that they should definitely call off the ceremony now, but she reminds him how important it is to him. Yes, she doesn't understand. She wants to run away because obviously folk are trying to kill her, but is also drawn to stay with Nigel slash Sam and moves to kiss him, but he refuses this. However, he does sort of bring her back round by responding that the ceremony is not as important to him as she is. And so they go to tell Drake and Claudia. So we're in the study. Yes, Claudia's pacing around as Victor examines the portrait and Alex and Sam enter. They inform them that the event is off. And while disappointed, they seem to take it... Surprisingly well. Well, yes, and (laughs) agree to leave. However, they want one final toast. And when Sam and Alex drink the red wine, they collapse as Drake sneers to Claudia that the Count will now have two offerings. Yeah, it was stupid. Very stupid. Here, have some of this. Well, the other two clearly aren't drinking. <laughs> yes. Um, and a, I, mean, I don't know, is it a dungeon? It's certainly a lower room, a basement type place. Torture Sam, room. Yes. Sam wakes to find himself tied to a table and discovers Drake's true colours. <laughs> You greatly disappoint me, Corrington. I must admit, I never imagined you the type to fall for a pretty face, especially one with such a sordid pedigree. You drugged me. You wish oh. you'd stay drugged before this night is over. You've done a very foolish thing. The Count will be displeased with your lack of commitment. Where's Alexandra? She's tied up at the moment. Don't worry. Soon you'll be together again for eternity. What do you want? Isn't it obvious? I want your soul. More directly, your blood. You can't be serious. I'm more than serious. I'm compelled. But that's murder. Nonsense! The soul can never die. It can only be reinvented. Dear, we've been waiting for you. The moon is high, my love. Yes, it's time. Never fail to be impressed by Sam's credulosity. <laughs> but that's a murder. You can't do a murder. <laughs> also, like to, when Drake said there, uh, oh, Sam asked what Drake wants. Says, Isn't it obvious? Your soul was like, nope, 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 that's not obvious at all. Nope. Of all the things that I uh, could think it might be, that was pretty far down the list. You guys are taking this seriously? <laughs> Victor so, goes on to tell Sam that he envies him. Yes, while Claudia and him continue doing some necking together. Yeah. Yeah. He thinks that Sam will soon know the secrets from beyond the grave. So sure, obviously he could as well then. If he wants to know the secrets from beyond the grave, then he could just Yeah, he doesn't want them as much as he wants to be honoured by the Count. (laughs) He leaves and for some reason Sam thinks that he can persuade Claudia to untie him by telling her he needs to stop Drake killing... Alexandra, he's got no clue. But yeah, very similar to episode. Sam, for some reason, thinks Claudia will listen to reason and asks her to untie him. <laughs> she's literally going out with a guy who thinks he's a vampire and is about to murder someone. It's like, yeah. oh, come on, let me go. She explains how disappointed Victor is that he thought Sam was the chosen one who would take them through the forest, but like all of the others before him, he is weak. Sam protests that it's not a, a gothic novel and people will die unless she unties him, but Claudia simply states that it's too late and the evil of man will be reborn that night and that Drake thinks their fates are preordained. I mean, she's a head case as well. Yeah, well, he tells her that Victor's insane, <laughs> but she insists that he's a genius. And will soon be king of both of them. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't. But again, Sam should be thinking, oh man, you're all wacko. It's like she's been playing this game for too long. She doesn't really know yes. what's going on. As she is talking, she's opening his collar. And just as Al arrives, she laughs maniacally and shows off her vampire teeth. Yes, yeah, she goes to bite Sam on the neck as Al protests furiously. But is saved from an unlikely source. She's bonked yes. on by, the head. By Boris. 
uh, who knocks it out and lets him loose. Al tries to get centred on Alex while Sam sends the butler to the town to get help before leaning over the body to prove to his slightly concerned self that she's not really a vampire. So he's trying to think, not just convince Al, but yeah. he wants to know for sure now. Yeah, so he removes her fake fangs. Yeah, a, a, a pair of plastic novelty teeth. Triumphantly, or triumphantly, tells Alice his vampires aren't real unless there's a dental plan <laughs> in hell. I liked Boris's excuse for why he'd come back. What was that? He forgot his cap. <laughs> At this point, Al tells Sam that Drake and Alex are on the roof. Yes, which is where we head. She is tied up while the maniac is a rambling, pretentious, gothic nonsense and is about to plunge the dagger into her. She's quite distressed and Victor tells her that he's been waiting his entire life to bridge the gap between the living and the dead and she will soon be with the master. <laughs> Sam appears and tells him to stop as they both know it's all made up and... Shows him the uh, the set, set of false teeth. <laughs> Victor immediately assumes that he has murdered Claudia. But Sam says he didn't, but will kill him if necessary and orders Drake to let Alex go. I did have visions here of Sam just knocking Victor off the roof and the two of them um, like leaping as Nigel and Victor fall to their death. Oh, that'd be a leaping back in would be horrendous. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, as you say, Victor tells him he has to embrace his destiny. Um, and agrees to Sam's suggestion that Alex should be released. As he stands behind her with his blade raised. But as Sam rushes to stop him, there is uh, some hilarious divine intervention. Yes, he raises his dagger and is immediately struck by lightning, which we believe kills him, or at least knocks him out. No, he, he, he falls backwards. Onto the open tomb that Sam and Al were at. Earlier. I've noted here this is high camp. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, whole, the entire episode is. Yes. We then go to the um, an inspector calls moment in the, in <laughs> yes. the drawing room. <laughs> the uh, the local cop has decided that he believes everything Alex has told him, and there's no need to bring Sam in for questioning. I don't understand what the detective says. He says there's no reason to bring him in, seeing as his family has lived here for many years. <laughs> so, well, you've lived here for a long time. You can't commit crime. But I, I think this is a um, just an, a, an example of the the unwarranted deference that perhaps people mm. in this uh, type of society as aristocracy might receive yeah i didn't immediately understand why but sam asks the detective to wait for a moment while he speaks to alex i've been thinking i think you should leave here You don't belong here. You don't belong here. And what happened tonight should convince you of that. I know, I know. You should get a lot of money for it. And I want you to go as far away as you can from here. You hear me? Please. Please. Now go on. The police are waiting to take you to town. Go. Don't think I'll ever understand any of this. So he's going to give her this dagger and she's going to go and sell it. Yeah, that'll go down well. She's going to pop into the local antique shop and get, you know, a hundred quid for a dagger. Yeah. Who's, who buys it? How does um, she know how to uh, negotiate the sale of this? Perhaps there's jewels in it or something. I don't yeah, know. but still, she's going to be uh, taken advantage of. You would think so. I'm hoping that Al's going to tell him she becomes a serial killer if she stabs eight men. <laughs> or uh, a I horror like, novelist. Yes. Yeah. But no. No, no. Yeah, no. What does he tell him? She becomes a missionary. Or, or something to do with missionary anyway. Yeah, on the on the streets, and, is, and he says she's fine. Not that yeah. she's now has a good life, but yeah. she's she lives. She doesn't die in poverty. Yes, she's, she's, she's taken by the Salvation Army or somebody. Yeah. So, 
Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. good for you, Alex. Yep. Sam thinks that uh, this is hilarious and that Al must be feeling stupid because of what he believed. And he admits that he got a little carried away. He does. However, when Sam picks up a shiny, shiny plate to check his reflection... Well, well that's the thing, but you know, Sam's quite ungracious. You can't take this victory... Oh, no, he says it should prove once and for all that there's no such thing as a vampire. Yes. Yeah, but what happens is cockiness is abruptly halted. Yes, because there's no reflection. And before he can tell Al anything about it, he leaps out. To where? He leaps in to a guy on the bonnet of a car wearing what looks like a variation on the Future Boy outfit. Yep, it's uh, on top of that, a 50s style car, which is being erased against another vehicle. Oh, boy. Indeed. So, do we assume Claudia got arrested? On what charges? Uh, he attempted murder. But Alex didn't see her doing anything, so... I bet, no, it'd be hard to prove. And also, Alex is away. Yeah. No, I think she probably gets off without... Yeah, there's no, there's no evidence here. I assume Victor's dead. And Al, Yeah. Yeah, of course, yeah, he definitely is dead, yeah. Maybe Boris spoke up. Uh, Even they'd then. Take, they'd fall asleep trying to take his statement. Yeah, I mean, and again, I he, saw. He, he's a butler and she comes from, I mean, I don't know, but is she a... Oh, she could be a fake aristocrat, I don't know. I think she disappears into the night, everyone's in battle, I mean, this isn't going to... Yeah, but she, maybe she sees sense to realise this was a lot of nonsense and she's out. Yeah, everyone wants to forget this. Yeah, it was good for once to see Sam aware of the dangers that might follow when he leaves. Yeah. Because there's been a couple of episodes where we've been concerned that he's leaving folk in a dangerous situation. Mm. Do we assume from the fact that there's no reflection that the plate was dirty or that he was a vampire? Well, I think we've had it a couple of times, this uh, dubious ending. No, he's, he's not clearly not a not a vampire. I think that... Uh, was Maybe it's the angle or something like that? Yeah. Any other thoughts before we move on? No, I mean, this again, we've said this, or I've said this before, would be a fine Halloween special, but I don't think it... No, it was. But, no, it was uh, originally aired on the 9th of February, 1993, after a three-week break. Directed by Alan J. Levy for the sixth and final time. You can hear more about him on the podcast for Kamikaze Kid. It was written by Tommy Thompson. This was the last of his 13 stories. And you can hear more about him on the podcast for Leaping In Without a Net. Victor Drake was played by our old friend Ian Buchanan. Oh. A familiar face and one of your fellow Hamiltonians. Yes, I spoke to him before. Yes, we have on the social media. After starting out as a fashion model, he found a home in soaps. Long Runs and General Hospital, The Bold and the Beautiful and Days of Our Lives, winning an Emmy in 1997 along with a pair of Soap Opera Digest Awards. He's also showed up on things like Nip Tuck, Stargate, SG-1, Twin Peaks and of course one episode of Columbo where he played the killer in Columbo Cries Wolf, one of the better episodes from the revival. And he was very good. He's now 67, remains He's active. Brilliant at playing smarmy. He was having a ball in this, eating the scenery. Fantastic. Claudia was played by Deborah Moore. This was her only Quantum Leap. She also appeared in Days of Our Lives, the Bond movie, Die Another Day. Bond movie, you say? And Sherlock, as well as providing voices for two of the Dragon Age games, which you already know are my favourites. Yeah. Um, she has a Bond connection. You might have heard of her dad. Moore. Moore. Sir, Sir Roger Moore. Oh, he also appeared in Bond movies. She's now 61, still active. Lady Alexandra Corrington was played by Shadolin. This was her only Quantum Leap. She's also appeared in things like Ellen, Dharma and Greg. Boardwalk Empire and Orange is the New Black. She's now 61 and has her own production company called Shot in the Dark Films and her last screen credit was in 2020. It's weird. I recognised her from Vegas Vacation where right. I think she played, she's meant to be like a teen but she's probably in her 30s at the time. Yeah, but that happens a few times. Or quite often these days. Well, I think it was cousin, one of the cousin uh, Griswolds. I think more in the 90s it was quite mm. a, a big thing for, yeah. Rod Loomis played Boris the Butler. This was his only quantum leap. He's also in General Hospital, Star Trek, The Next Generation, The Bold and the Beautiful, and you'll remember him as Sigmund Freud in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I watched that just the other night with the, the boy. He's now 82, his last screen credit was in 2010. And briefly, the detective who showed up at the end was played by a guy called Garth Wilton. This was his only quantum leap. He's also in The Fall Guy, Heart to Heart, Diagnosis Murder, Titanic. He graduated from RADA in 1953 and his last screen credit was in 2001. Uh, the episode received an Emmy nomination for art direction. Uh, the reference to Count Bathory. In real life, there was a Countess Bathory who was reported to bathe in the blood of virgins to maintain her youth. So that's kind of a near real world reference. This is the only episode in which the only Americans are Al and Sam. Huh? In terms of things that we learned, Al believes in the undead. Yeah. Okay. Number ones. 
Well, so you, some, some other on this date stuff before we get to the number one. Sure. Tenth uh, of March, seventy-five. Patent was granted in the UK for dog spectacles. <laughs> uh, Rocky Horror opened in New York and in Japan. A high-speed rail connection between Osaka and Fuck You Okea. What? Which, so excuse me. A high-speed rail connection between Osaka and Fuck You Okea or Fuck You Oka. I'm um, certainly am. Uh, F U K U O K A. Mm -hmm. The two largest cities in the west of the country um, opened, and North Vietnam secured a crucial victory over the South Vietnamese at Ban Mi Tut or Tut. A victory that led directly to overall defeat for the South. Was that three two after the extra time? Something like that. I think it was more overwhelming actually. In the UK, the number one record was Telly Savalas, you mentioned Kojak there with F. Whilst in the US we had the or they had the Doobie Brothers and Blackwater. Next week, Sam bumps into an old acquaintance, no spoilers here, but he finds himself in a college frat house in Return of the Evil Leaper. So, we'll see you in 1956. Until then, cheerio. Bye-bye.